Welcome to Soccer Morning on NASN. Here's your host, Jason Davis. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Jason Davis here with you. NASN.TV. Soccer Morning. Soccer Morning coming at you on a Thursday. It's a beautiful soccer morning. Oh, no matter where you are. It's not morning everywhere, but I'm sure it was a fine soccer morning in England and a fine soccer morning in Germany and whatever you want to call it. Football, whatever, I don't know, whatever word you want to use to call this, uh, to, to name this game that we love so much. And why we're, why, why we're here every day, 10 to, 30, 10 to 11.30 a.m. Eastern. I apologize. I just came out of the blocks. Uh, terrible today. Tripped up several times already. It's going to get better, I promise. Uh, we've got a big show today. Stephen Goff of the Washington Post will join us in just a couple of minutes. We'll talk to him about that. Uh, a widely reported poll of D.C. residents that says 60% of them are against a D.C. United Stadium. We'll put some context on that. Stephen Goff certainly on top of that story. Maybe we'll talk to him about the uh, reformation of D.C. United heading into 2014. Uh, and some, some wider MLS thoughts from a guy who's been covering this league since the very, very beginning. And covering soccer in this country for a, a long, long time. Also on this show, Curtis Larson of the Toronto Sun will join us at 11 o'clock to talk about Toronto FC Stadium. Now you're thinking, wait a second, Toronto FC has a stadium. It's BMO Field. They've been there since 2007 when they entered MLS. Well, there are some questions surrounding BMO Field. Uh, Curtis Larson himself may tell us why uh, TFC should be looking to build their own new, more MLS 2.0 building. Because let's be, uh, let's be honest, let's be fair. Despite the fact that BMO Field's not that old, it was uh, built relatively inexpensively and does not meet the standard that has been set by places like Sporting Park. So perhaps TFC, if they want to be a big club and they've just spent $100 million on a couple of players, maybe they need to be looking at a new building. Plus, you have a new wrinkle with the ownership group uh, for TFC, MLSE, looking to perhaps buy the Toronto Argonauts, the CFL franchise up there. Would that mean a ground share between the Argonauts and TFC? And what kind of impact would that have on the soccer also today, let's let's start with what happened yesterday on the field in England. Uh, Premier League games, several midweek games happened yesterday. Manchester City is now your Premier League leaders after destroying, absolutely demolishing Tottenham. 5-1, was that the scoreline? It was a, a, a beating of epic proportions. Now, the game changed on Danny Rose's red card. And if that doesn't come, perhaps Tottenham can hold on and put in more of a fight. Uh, saw Tom Sherwood's comments after the game. He was very circumspect. Very, uh, he admitted, look, they're a very, very good team. It's difficult. Not many teams are on, a, on the same planet as Manchester City right now. So perhaps it would have been difficult for Tottenham regardless. But the red card definitely changed the game. Uh, Manchester City's attacking quality showed through. They are now on 53 points, one point ahead of Arsenal, who we mentioned yesterday when, when we talked to, um, talked to Luke Moore. Uh, came out of Tuesday's game with a draw against Southampton after leading that game, effectively dropping two points, and now they find themselves in second place. And the question here, and I think this is what most people who observe the Premier League will be thinking today, will Arsenal ever get back on top? Will anybody else overtake Manchester City from here on out? They have been on fire. They, they figured out their away form problems. They haven't lost uh, they, they, they haven't lost. I think they've dropped two points total away since losing to Sunderland back in November. They haven't lost, period. I don't know. It's an insane stretch at this point. They have two losses on the year. I think the last one of those was that it may have been that Sunderland game. 68 goals scored. 68. Arsenal has 45. At, Liverpool has 57. They're second. 11 back. But they've also given up 26. Their goal differential is 42. Their goal differential is 18 more than Arsenal's. 19 or uh, 17 more than uh, whatever. Their goal differential is insane. Manchester City is insane at this point. Nick's got a good point on Twitter as I talk about uh, BMO Field, and we'll, we'll perhaps ask Curtis Larson about how this plays into it. Canada announcing that they intend to bid for the 2026 World Cup. What does that, how does that impact Toronto FC stadium situation? Because clearly, look, I think the infrastructure is there for the most part in Canada to host a World Cup. But 
there's going to have to be some improvement in some places. Can, can you imagine World Cup games happening at the Rogers Center? I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with uh, how how much that building is behind the times. And clearly, it's an indoor building. You're gonna lay. We do Detroit again. Detroit '94 again. Lay some lay some sod down on on top of a uh, an artificial surface. Uh, speaking of artificial surfaces, again, this is all stuff we'll talk to with uh, talk with Curtis Larson about. Uh, Tim Lewicki, while mentioning perhaps an upgrade to BMO Field, has said that they are committed to natural grass. The, again, the question is if the if MLSC buys the Argos and moves the Argos from the Rogers Center into BMO Field, whether or not the surface there can handle Canadian football and soccer, and whether or not it destroys uh, the integrity of the surface when it comes to soccer, because clearly. You can play football in the mud. I've played football in the mud. It's a blast. Didn't really infect, affect the game that much. Yes, footing's not the greatest, and maybe you can't throw the ball as well. But in fact, it doesn't really change the game fundamentally. Soccer, you got to have some kind of decent surface. This isn't the first division in 1983. We've got to have some kind of de- decent surface, and that'll be a problem that TFC will have to deal with. Last night as well, uh, or yesterday as well, in the Premier League, Again, the, the, the Manchester City overtaking first place. I think a lot of people will talk about whether or not that's... It, it's not done. Plenty of season left. Lots of season left. But the way they look right now, can anyone overtake them? Meanwhile, a team that was challenging for that top spot, three points back, Chelsea. A, a 0-0 draw with West Ham in which they outshot the Hammers 38-1, to 39-1, to something insane like that. And the best part of that, that match wasn't the match itself which was effectively Chelsea ramming its head against the wall, West Ham doing nothing uh, offensively. The best part of that match was the fallout afterward, in which Jose Mourinho says West Ham played 19th century football. And Sam Allardyce responds, I don't really give it. I think he said shite. Can I say shite on the air? That's not really a swear word to use too much in this country. Can I say shite? I've said it three times already, or twice already. Okay, I've said it. The best, the best part of that is... Uh, Sam Allardyce, basically saying, I don't care. And, and, and I, th- I think the dynamic there that, that is funny to people who have been paying attention is that Jose Mourinho made his name playing a re- reactionary style of football and making it, t- turning that style and his tactical genius, and let's, let's be fair, Mourinho is a tactical genius, for, for lack of a better description. But he managed to somehow make that a... a, a, a an attra- uh, not attractive style. It's not an attractive way to play necessarily, but he made it seem like genius. That's what it was. Sam Allardyce goes out there. Now, I don't know that Chelsea has ever, or, or a Mourinho team has ever given up 39 shots to one, but they clearly made he, the guy, the guy coined the phrase parking the bus. He knows all about playing that style of, of soccer. And for him to come out and criticize, it's Jose Mourinho, of course. It's just, it, it, it's, a, it's particularly amazing to have Jose Mourinho criticizing Sam Allardyce's tactics when Mourinho has been known, even with teams that could compete on a talent level with their opponent, known to play that reactionary style. Fascinating stuff yesterday in the Premier League. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we will get into MLS with Stephen Goff, the soccer insider from the Washington Post. It's Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN with Jason Davis. Back on Soccer Morning, now turning to MLS. On the phone with me now, soccer insider Stephen Goff of the Washington Post. Hi, Steve. Hey, Jason. How are you? I'm good. Uh, thank you for taking uh, the time to talk to us this morning or talk to me this morning and, and therefore the audience because that's us. Steve, let me start with, uh, look, we, we've been following the D.C. United Stadium saga for it's been years. I mean, obviously, this is a, this is uh, something that, that DC United has wanted to get done for a very long time. We we seem to have the framework of a of a deal in place. We know D, uh, for for those not familiar, and I think most people are, DC City Council matters can be excruciatingly slow, and that's been the case here. But the most recent development, and we'll get maybe get to the mechanics of the deal in a second. The most recent development is a poll that indicates something like 60%, 65% of D.C. residents are opposed to a D.C. United Stadium. That, that was the headline, Steve. Is there some further context that, that m- maybe uh, will shed some light on as to whether or not that number is actually true? I think the number is true, but, um, you know, the question was framed as do you support the city uh, helping to finance a soccer stadium? Um, and... Uh, you know, people's knee-jerk reaction is, of course, going to be no, because most people do not follow this issue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it has been in the news, obviously, for years, for really a decade. Um, but, you know, there's, there's not day-to-day updates, so I, I don't think people are really up, up on it. Um, mm-hmm. the, first, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the baseball stadium, yeah. which... Uh, the city financed for some six hundred million dollars, and at the time, um, it was quite it was quite a contentious debate about whether that should occur. Um, so, you know, there's a there's an issue of stadium fatigue in the city. People hear public financing and stadium, their initial reaction would be hell no. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the fact that thirty five percent are in favor of it. Um, in this just very random, unsa- unsophisticated <laughs> all question, yeah. um, is a positive. That, that's a good point. Um, and, and really, I guess you know what we can get to is whether or not it actually matters. I'll ask you that in a second. But you did point out that yeah. the baseball stadium, and I found it fascinating that, and I, I've never lived in DC. I've been around DC a lot of my life, but I never lived in DC. I found it fascinating that the in the same, well, maybe the same poll, or or perhaps in a different poll. The, the opinion on the baseball stadium financing has flipped, and, and there was a lot of opposition before the city uh, helped finance that stadium, and now most, most D.C. residents see it as a positive. Yeah, I mean, once you see uh, something like that built, and perhaps you go to games, and, you know, your, your, your paycheck has not been uh, severely impacted. Uh, you know, I, I think this is common in, in mm-hmm. all walks of life, um, whether it's a stadium or a bridge or uh, public school um, budgets increasing, you know, it, initially people fear that it's, it's going to affect their lives, mm-hmm. affect their paycheck. And in the long run, often it does not. And when you see the final product, whether it's a better school or um, a nice stadium that, that attracts people from out of town and, and improves the aesthetics of, of the city, then, you know, you're okay with it. I, I, I imagine the same, the impact will be the same um, if when the, the budget point project is complete mm-hmm. and people see it and they visit it, not just for soccer, but for other events, they see the impact it would have on, on a forgotten neighborhood and how it will really link the Navy Yard with the baseball stadium area to the southwest waterfront, mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's really a long term vision for the city that the entire uh, w- waterfront uh, riverside development is is linked for for miles. And right now, Buzzard Point is, is kind of the, the kind of interrupts that flow. Mm-hmm. The the mechanics of this are a land swap deal, which is effectively the major contribution of the city. And, and really, I mean, it has to happen. Otherwise, the land's not there for the team to pay to build the stadium because that's what uh, that's what the plan is. And, and maybe if uh, that context was provided to 
uh, the people being polled, they, they might respond in, in a different way. But really, I guess the question, Steve, is whether this kind of d- uh, polling data has any impact whatsoever on the project going forward, uh, or are we really just waiting to see if Vincent Gray gets reelected? Um, I, well, the mayoral ra- race is this year, and um, obviously this is Gray's project, so if he wins, certainly uh, things will, will stay on course. Um, but even some of his competitors, uh, challengers in the race are, are for the stadium project, mm-hmm. Jack Evans, um, among them, uh, Tommy Wells. So, uh, if Gray loses, it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, derail the stadium project. Okay. Um, you know, it certainly could change some of the terms and, um, maybe disrupt the timetable, but, uh, that, that won't, um, hurt too much. Um, well, remind me a little of the first part of the question. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the land swap, and I guess that really, oh, yeah, yeah. At, at this point, what, what United fans and MLS fans who want to see United in their own building are concerned about is that there have been several, um, several deadlines missed. Is that, is, is that a major indication that this is going to be more difficult, or you know, should, because it's D.C., or should we just sort of push that to the side and say, well, as long as it's moving along, that's a good, that's a good sign? Yeah, I mean, it was going to be difficult all along. Um, deadlines or not, you know, you, you're dealing with a very complex proposal with a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, the legislation has to be introduced at some point. They're still working out some details. Um, this is not a simple, straightforward uh, land purchase, mm-hmm. uh, zoning permits, uh, construction begin. You know, if it were that simple, it would have been up by now. But, um, you know, you're dealing with a, a complex situation and deadlines are going to have been missed and are going to continue to be missed. Um, the general consensus from people I talk to is that, you know, this, this is going to happen, just not on the timeline that, you know, DC United and uh, Mayor Gray would like. Uh, it, it will be scrutinized. It should be scrutinized. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's a lot of issues involved, and it's it's going to take time. The, the idea of them playing there in 2016 is is uh, you know it's pretty silly. Um, 2017, 2017 seems like the, the best case scenario, and you know we'll see what happens in the next few months. Let me let me turn now to some some MLS business, and and I want to specifically ask you. You've been one of uh, the leading voices in pushing MLS to be more transparent with their rules, and and we've had the somewhat recent development of 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 the league of admitting we basically change rules as we see fit, and we feel that that's a uh, that's an asset for us. DC United traded with the Philadelphia Union, the top allocation spot, um, and and Ethan White got Jeff Park in return. The Union have now signed Marisa Du and used that allocation uh, spot, but we had just seen. The uh, Toronto FC and the Seattle Sounders obtain American returning American internationals without having to go through that process. Uh, is is this and the league's response was essentially, well, there's there's new rules and we'll be telling you about them later. <laughs> Are we seeing any progress on this transparency front? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a Byzantine league. It's just <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's a little bit more. Um, the situation with DC United and the possibility of getting Maurice do was DC United was not going to uh, was not going to acquire him anyway because his price tag was just way too high mm-hmm. and they've already gotten Eddie Johnson and they're going to give him a big contract so they're not they weren't going to get it Maurice do anyway so that uh, you know they 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 pulled out of the running for for Edu and even Marco Papa mm-hmm. um, yeah I mean the the way it's still not clear. There's still a lot of smoke and mirrors um, with with these returning players. Uh, the do situation was that although he's a returning national team player, he doesn't go into do allocation because he's a DP. However, he's a DP who returned to the league without MLS uh, assistance, financial <laughs> assistance. They weren't involved in the move. Therefore, he's back in the allocation order. It's crazy. It's silly. Uh, we've become kind of numb to this process. 
I, I, you know, I just don't understand why the league doesn't simplify things. Uh, it's infuriating to a lot of fans. It's confusing to fans and to the media. There's even, there's even executives around the league who don't know what's going on in a lot of cases. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, you would think, this has been my point all along, um, starting with the Michael, uh, with the Clint Dempsey thing last summer, is that you would think after 18 seasons, there would be more transparency and a cleaner way of uh, player acquisition distribution. And, and, and we're still not there. Essentially, in two words, my message to the league is grow up. Mm-hmm. And it, it just, it just doesn't happen. We, you know, we continue to see it with other things too. You know, two college players decide to join the league a few days after the draft. <laughs> and now they're in a wave of draft. So that was beneficial to DC United because, uh, Cristiano Francois, who would have been a first round pick in the super draft, Suddenly, a week later, is available in the waiver draft, and DC United has the first pick in the waiver draft. So, not only do they get the burn bomb with the number two overall pick, they get Cristiano Francois, who probably would have been a top ten pick mm. a week earlier. So, what what's the solution? I don't know. Do you make those kids wait until the summer to join the league? I don't know if that's the solution because then they go off to Europe or Central America to sign. Um, Maybe uh, I don't know what it is, but mm-hmm. there's got to be a better way. It's see, it it's it always ends up being the ends seem to justify the means, at least from an MLS perspective, and and clearly that's going to frustrate um, everybody else who doesn't know what's going to happen from day to day. And let me, you mentioned the league growing up, and and we've got a another round of CBA negotiations coming up after this season. We've seen some of the groundwork laid in terms of, of talking points. Don Garber saying that the league is still losing 75 to $100 million. And when people hear that, they immediately chuckle a little bit, especially when the league is paying transfer fees for Michael Bradley and, and Clint Dempsey and teams like TFC are dropping $100 million on players. What, you know, what kind of feeling do you get? I know it's a long way away. What kind of feeling do you get about this particular CBA negotiation? And will it be fundamentally different from what happened the last time around? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know where this one's really headed. I, I think, um, I, I think the to start the, the re-entry drafts was was a good step in the last CBA. I got a hunch. I got a feeling that that will uh, favor the players more so in the next deal. Um, that'll be closer to full free agency. Mm. Um, uh, you know, that if, if you're selected by a team, well, you won't even be selected by a team. You can just sign. Uh, I think that'll change. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's a weird one. And, and I is. think it's just going to kind of hang over the league throughout this year. Um, and, you know, the, I don't think people will be talking about it much between now and the World Cup, but as we get into late summer mm. and the issues, issues will certainly surface because, uh, it's, you know, it's not going to be a simple process. And even a few years ago when things were a little, you know, when, when things were a little easier and breezier in the league, even that negotiation was difficult mm. and, and threatened to, uh, disrupt the start of the league. So, yeah, it's going to be, be an interesting one. I you, think. Have to, you have to imagine that the players are going to feel more emboldened than ever to to take their shot at a couple of things. It's been it's been such an unpredictable last six seven months in MLS that it, it's impossible to really figure out what's going to happen there and, and and what they'll be pushing for. They're they're not yeah. they're not as public as the league with their statements either. I mean, it's not like you know we we've, we've got Foose or Eddie Pope out front saying here's yeah. here's the deal. Um, let me well, speak. The league the league will make the argument too. Hey, look, we're expanding. Mm-hmm. We're creating jobs. Right. The the average salary uh, has gone up. We're not, you know, we're not paying players twenty thousand dollars anymore. Um, you know, the money is out there, and the jobs are out there because we're, uh, you know, we're expanding. So, mm. 
um, you know, both sides will certainly make their points, and and hopefully they can they can figure it out. Uh, speaking of, of of rules, this is tangentially c- connected because w- we've heard that the rules are being tweaked now in light of the LA Galaxy deciding that rather than uh, partner with a USL pro team and send a couple of players on loan, they're going to start their own team within that league. Their reserve team will move into that league, LA Galaxy 2, with the Roman numerals because, of course. And, and, and Steve, I, I mean, I think this is fascinating from a developmental standpoint. I don't know how successful yeah. they'll be. I imagine they'll lose a lot of games, but that might actually benefit their kids in the long run. But the league having to tweak the rules, and, and Alexi Lala said on Twitter yesterday that MLS will make it so that uh, those players can be subject to discovery claims by other teams, which essentially is, is is there to keep LA from being able to have double the roster spots of of other teams. But shouldn't have all shouldn't all of that have been sorted out before LA decided we're going to do this? Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it certainly creates uh, some issues, just like you said and, and Alexi mentioned. Um, uh, you know the. On the surface, it's a great. I think it's a great thing because mm-hmm. you, you see, like you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid and Bayern Munich all have their two teams, the second team. Um, even teams like you know Hoffenheim, you know uh, the kid Joseph Joseph Jow mm-hmm. from here in Maryland, Maryland D.C. area, he plays for Hoffenheim too. Um, now, certainly MLS is, is structured differently. Um, and there are issues with the Galaxy uh, <laughs> retaining more players than anyone else because they have a, a third division club of their own. Um, I, I think it's a I think it's a positive development. This is the first team to do it, and ho- hopefully more will follow suit. And the league's got to figure out, hey, look, you know, we're not going to allow LA to retain a uh, you know uh, a fifty player roster. Um, while everyone else is mm-hmm. at twenty five to thirty, right. so um, <laughs> yeah, no, this is part, this is part of MLS's evolution and growth, and hopefully they work this out so it's fair and and the galaxy is not at a uh, you know a, a huge advantage in terms of youth development. Before I get let you go, Steve, I've, I've been asked to to ask you to perhaps clarify uh, something we breezed past that that maybe there are, are executives in this league who don't who aren't aware of the roster rules from, from week to week and day to day. Is that something that you've heard directly expressed by, by executives? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, they trying to think what the circumstance, it must've been the Dempsey. Okay. Been Dempsey was coming in last summer and, you know, the, the initial thought was, well, he's, he's a returning U S national team player. And no one was, Compensated when he left, which means they no longer hold any, you know, any ties to him. So he, he has to go to allocation, right? Well, it wasn't spelled out. You know, you go on the MLS website where all the roster rules are, and um, it's not spelled out that he doesn't go through allocation. Mm-hmm. Um, and just talking to people around the league, you know, there were a couple that said, "Well, we're actually asking MLS." how, why this is, how this is working, because we don't know. Right. And these are people who've been around the league for many years, and um, they, they were not as confused as fans, but certainly had questions about how Dempsey was re-entering the league uh, directly to Seattle. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating. You know, again, I think it's, a, it's, it's, also, it's that matter of, well, we can get Clint Dempsey... We don't really have rules in place to make sure he ends up where he wants to be or we want him to be, so we're going to fudge it. And then, you know, what, at the end of the day, all of those executives will say, "Will say, yeah, it's great, Clint Dempsey's in our league," and and they know yeah. that, so that so it gives them cover when it comes to to changing the rules around to make sure what they want to happen happens. Yeah, the the league sees it as look, we're we're making this move to improve the quality of our league. Um, and yeah, people might be upset with it, but Clint Dempsey is an MLS player, right? Uh, period, and that's what they care about most. Um, I disagree with that. You know, I, I think um, it, it's almost like MLS is the director of a movie, and the director says, "Places, everyone, places," uh, and then you know they watch it play out. 
Um, but I don't, I don't know if a league should be, um, I don't think that should be a responsibility. It should be the club's responsibility. It, it, obviously, the bigger issue here is, you know, the single entity and mm-hmm. um, certainly autonomy has grown over the years for MLS clubs, but there's still that, uh, you know, man behind the curtain um, pushing buttons, pulling levers to uh, to make things make things better. Um, and they are better, but um, a little transparency would, would certainly help. There you go. Stephen Goff, the soccer insider from the Washington Post, joining us talking a little bit United and and MLS frustration because that's a, a daily part of our lives these days. Thank you very much for your time, Steve. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot. Let's uh let's keep moving along. Steve Goff, uh, always excellent. Again, this guy, he he's been around for a very long time and, and seen the development of the league. And, and and if he's frustrated with transparency, then it's certainly justified that the fans are. And they, and I said this, I I think I said this on yesterday's show. We live in an era where fans are more aware of the day-to-day rules of putting together teams in every sport than they've ever been before. That the rules are typically explained by these major competitions because they know that the fans are, are out there on the internet talking about it. You know, citizen journalism is a thing now. Blogs are a thing. I'm sitting here because I started a blog and I wouldn't have been able to uh, speak from any sort of, uh, of, of knowledge base without some things being out there that we can talk about. So... It's clear. It's clear that, that this is not a trend you can stop, and MLS is fighting against it because, by their nature, they have decided we need the flexibility to do what we what we want when we want in order to take uh, take shortcuts to becoming the type of league that we want to become. All right, uh, the uh, the pro rail stuff has ta- started on Twitter, so I'm just gonna ignore that. Yeah, the, those those it, the answer isn't necessary. Okay, whatever. The answer is not necessarily that. Uh, let's open the phone lines three four seven seven five six six two seven six. We've got Curtis Larson of the Toronto Sun at eleven o'clock. We'll talk TFC and their stadium situation. In the meantime, last night in San Antonio, Mexico beat South Korea four nothing. A hat trick for Mexico debutant Alan Polito. Uh, what did uh, what did Miguel Herrera learn last night in in San Antonio? He learned he's got a couple of youngsters coming through that may be uh, helpful for him when he gets to Brazil in the summer. There's certainly things to be learned. It's a domestic, heavily domestically based roster. Um, he had uh, he had several guys in the field who had never played for Mexico, Mexico before, mixed in with guys like uh, like Oribe Peralta and and Rafa Marquez in the back line. And and I watched most of the game until it really got boring. Because look, I mean, you know, once Mexico was up two three nothing, it was kind of like, oh, well, that's a foregone conclusion that the the field wasn't that great. Fifty plus thousand at the Alamo Dome. That uh, shows again the power of Mexico in the U.S. But what I think most people are taking away from that game is defensive frailty. Now, specifically Rafa Marquez. I mean, whether or not the makeup of that three-man back line for Mexico is the same when they get to Brazil is an open... I mean, th- th- there's a lot of moving parts. He's obviously got some options, Herrera does. But Rafa Marquez is the one guy he said is a lock for the squad. Does that mean he's a lock to start? I don't know. But he, d- he did say he's the captain. He's in my squad. He's the only guy who's got a guaranteed spot. So if we've got Mar- Rafa Marquez on the field for Mexico then they've got a serious speed issue in their back line. And it, and it reared its ugly head a couple of times for, for South Korea, who should have done better last night. 5-1-6, you're on the air. Uh, hey, Tom, I was wondering, do you think that it was a good move for Jermaine Jones to go to the Sheikas? Uh, I, I got that, uh, yeah, I got that on my list. Um, Jermaine Jones moving, the, the rumors are, and he's been photographed in Turkey, so I'm assuming it's done. Uh, the rumors are that Jermaine Jones is going on loan to Besiktas uh, through the end of the season. Uh, this is a guy who has had on and off his problems at Schalke, getting along with, with the brass there. If, if this means he's going to play and he's going to be relatively content and he's going to be putting in serious effort and playing in a competitive league, a, a league. This, isn't like, this isn't like Jermaine Jones has traded uh, the Bundesliga for, uh, for N- Norway or something. This is a competitive, strong league. Besiktas is obviously a big team in Turkey. I think it's a good move. I think from a U.S. men's national team perspective, it's a good move. We don't have to really ask those questions that we're asking about Michael Bradley and Clint Dempsey. Agreed or disagreed? 
I, I agree, but would it, would it be a better friend to move to MLS? I don't think so. And, and and look, I don't know that he has closed the book on what's happening at Shelka. And I'm not sure Shelka is ready to let him go. I don't know what his contract situation is right now. But if what I've heard is correct and this is a loan, then clearly they are not to the point where it's sell Jermaine Jones, whose value may be questionable at this point anyway, based on his age, and or or let him go on a free. I mean, if they still see value in him, they can send him to Turkey. He can play and get ready for the World Cup, and then they can reevaluate the situation come the summer. He may make a move to MLS come summer, but for the meantime, this this buys them a little time to sort of flesh out what they want to do about his situation as Schalke. Plus, plus, I'm not sure. Thanks for the comment. I'm not sure that there's a look. There's a lot of MLS teams that could use Jermaine Jones. Let's not uh, uh, let's not deny that. But it, it may become a little bit of a question of how you get him into the league, especially if it wasn't going to be um, on a free and he's uh, completely up uh, up for grabs. I mean, do you treat Jermaine Jones the same way you treated Clint Dempsey and Michael Bradley? I don't know. What do the rules say? Well, let me. Oh wait. That's right. They're, they're written in pencil. The rules are. So there you go. Six months alone to, to Besiktas, says uh, David on Twitter. That's uh, per U.S. soccer. So there that. Uh, Besh Iktash. Sorry. If I'm getting the pronunciation wrong, I don't know. Just move along. It looks like Besiktas. I'll say Besh, Besh, Besh Iktash. Uh, pronunciation uh, discussion. Always fun on, uh, on soccer morning. All right. Back to Mexico. If you have any particular insight into what you saw with Mexico, go ahead and give me a call, 347-756-6276. I think the, one of the talking points coming out of that game, not only what you, we saw from Mexico, and, and look, it, it's already, and, and I, um, this was certainly expressed by Alejandro Moreno on, Moreno on the tw- um, broadcast last night, it's already better for Mexico because 2013 is behind them and it's a new year and they can, uh, they are, they're qualified for the World Cup. They can wipe the slate clean and get ready for Brazil. So they made some progress. You beat on a team for nothing. I don't care what kind of players are on the field, B side, C side, whatever. That gives you some some confidence and some some momentum moving forward. the The question, the the thing that's going to come out of that game, because the United States play South Korea on Saturday at uh, the SubHub Center in in LA. The question for the United States then is, will we will we be judging the U.S. by that Mexico result? And I'm and I'm curious among the U.S. fan base out there, if the United States wins one nothing, two nothing, ties that draws that game one one two two something like that, or even well, losing, I think we would all have real questions about this particular player pool and whoever is in this player pool who's who might be going to Brazil. But if they don't win for nothing, if they if they are less emphatic in their victory, does that say anything about the U.S. in relation to Mexico? Again, this this will, and I'm, I'm I know I'm building a straw man here, so I apologize a little bit because this hasn't yet become a topic of discussion. But I have a feeling it will be after the game. The United States has to stop judging itself by Mexico, except for in those cases when they are playing Mexico. The idea isn't necessarily just to be better than Mexico, because regional dominance is great. But we know what Concacaf is. The idea is to be better for when you get to the World Cup, and those preparations ongoing. Again, this is January. Seasons are happening. Most of those Mexican players in season, by the way, when we see the United States play with South Korea on Saturday, MLS players not in season yet. They'll be in a month-long camp. They have, they'll have gone to Brazil and played some games together, which I think gives them a strong base, but it's not quite the same thing. So plenty of questions surrounding what, uh, what, how will we be judging the United States depending on their result against South Korea on Saturday. In the meantime, Mexico makes progress. Uh, I suggest you go and check out the uh, the column by Tom Marshall, our friend, uh, uh, Mexico World Cup on Twitter, who was on the show yesterday. The good and bad for Mexico's friendly win over South Korea outlines it here. This is at Sporting News is where I'm finding it. Um, he, he talks specifically about that back line. Francisco Rodriguez, Rafa Marquez, Diego Reyes. Partnership didn't look solid in the first half. It uh, goes through a couple of instances where they were particularly shaky. Uh, but, again, you, you, hold, you keep a clean sheet, you score four goals, Really, what we're doing here is nitpicking. Really, what we're doing here is looking for cracks. But, and the context is, is important here for not only Mexico's team, but for the United States and for South Korea. Effectively, what we saw last night is the best of Liga MX, or, or what Miguel Herrera has available to him in Liga MX, is better than what 
uh, uh, Hung Wing Bo has available to him in the K League. What does that mean exactly? Mm, I don't know. It's more about those individual performances. Maybe Miguel Herrera found somebody in Polito that he can take, uh, take to Brazil and have on the bench as an additional weapon for him. Because there's already, uh, well, Peralta scored. I think it's already kind of been accepted that right now, as things stand, based on form, national team, and club, that Peralta has overtaken Chicharito as the number one striker for Mexico. If I'm wrong about that, let me know. But I think that that's sort of the conventional wisdom right now. And uh, Herrera's job isn't necessarily, you know, his job right now is to sort of build that confidence back up by whatever means necessary. He is, uh, as Tom Marshall told us yesterday, he is committed to his system. He's going to work players into his system, not the other way around. What, whether or not they can be effective, they need every opportunity they can. They have one FIFA date to get the entire t- squad together between now and Brazil, and everything else is going to be teams that are not completely full strength. All right. Uh, so let's, uh, let's move on a little bit. Phone line's still open, 347-756-6276. Again, uh, Curtis Larson coming up at 11 o'clock. In fact, let's do this. Let's go ahead, take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about Jerome Champagne. Yeah, Champagne? French is terrible, too. Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. We'll talk about Jerome Champagne and his FIFA presidential candidacy platform. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN with Jason Davis. Back on Soccer Morning, got a call talking about Mexico Tay from Virginia. What's up, Tay? How are you doing? I'm good, man. So you wanted to talk about Mexico and South Korea a little bit? Yeah, especially in the South Korean side. Um, I think uh, this coming Saturday, Mexico is the U.S. I think uh, the Korean team would have to play a little better because uh, in in Korea, like the, not only players but their family members too, like get was severely criticized. Wow. They played really badly. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Yeah, and then uh, uh, yesterday, basically, uh, before the games, uh, when the when the Korean um, players are interviewed, uh, like one of the two guys were saying, like, between the domestic Korean players and international league uh, Korean players, the difference are like paper thin. Mm. And they'll kind of want to prove that. So, but last night didn't go so well. So, no. Uh, did, well, uh, from, from, from what you saw... I mean, again, this is a January friendly, and and I understand pressure to perform. And and look, you don't want to lose if you can't if you can help it. But this is a this is not necessarily a game that's going to inform the South Korean performance in Brazil. What's what were they trying to get done, and and really what was the major failure? The problem is like uh, obviously in the in World Cup squad, most of the players be based in Europe. But the problem is our goalkeepers. Our some of our defensive uh, uh, squad members mm-hmm. has come from K League, mm-hmm. and um, the usual starting goalkeeper, um, he he was decent, but um, he was okay. So they were looking for the competition, and last night's goalkeeper was supposed to compete with him for the job, but 
thing about him is he's 24 years old, obviously, so his game is quite up and down. Mm-hmm. So I keep playing London 12 to, uh, 2012. Uh, he played well against against Great Britain, but he complete, you know, blew. I mean, uh, imploded against Brazil. So yeah, it's his a- game's up and down. He's indecisive. So that's a question. Our four we've always been the question. So mm-hmm. you know, I mean, Hong Yun will try to get some answers to that question. And, he, and he's in tough situation because he just got the job very recently after the qualification was done. Mm-hmm. So he got a bunch of friendlies and he needs to get his squad together where he wants to play. So yeah. Yeah, it, it's a mess. Let me ask you about, because look, this hasn't, it hasn't happened here yet. And maybe it, for the United States, maybe it will one day, but, but to have a legend like him managing the, the national team, do you think that's a good situation or does it cause additional problems? I think it's a good situation because, um, besides the fact he's a legend, but I think he has ideas. Okay. Uh, the problem with the Korean Federation is they cannot keep the management manager together for, for uh, I mean, for a full work cycle. Yeah. I mean, going after 1998, uh, in 20, 2000, uh, uh, 2002 cycle, we had two managers. Thankfully, Gus Hooding came on. That's you uh, know had a two-year time period where he can make adjustments. But 2006. We had three different coaches, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. 2010, uh, we, had, we had like two coaches, and then this cycle we have three, and Hong Yong be the third one. So, yeah. and he, I mean, as I said, he came in when all the qualification was done. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's even a little tough, but I, I hope uh, Korean uh, Federation give him a chance after this cycle mm-hmm. to see what he can do because he did well uh, in the Olympic, you know, for the Olympic uh, competition. So. Yeah, it's uh, so the last four years it's been really difficult for Korean national team to develop. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get the chance to talk to a, a Korean soccer uh, expert, and I'm going to call you an expert. I'm not even, you know, I'm sure you would call yourself that, but you certainly know Korean soccer. Let me ask you something. This is not really related to uh, the national team right now, but I- I'm seeing some things about um, uh, making the the Asian Cup a much bigger tournament. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean the, uh, I mean, thing about is. Uh, I'm not sure, like, because Asian Cup really comes down to a few teams, right? Like, we've got Australia, Japan, Korea, mm-hmm. and then we have Iran and uh, Iraq. Those are the teams that are in Saudi Arabia. Those are the teams that's going to compete. Like, when it comes to, like, other other countries like Thailand, Hong Kong, or, you know, some other, other countries, like, they're not quite there. And China is supposed to be pushing for it, but when I see them last, I'm not sure how much development they've made. So... Mm-hmm. They can expand the Asian Cup, but it waters it I'm down. Not sure how it, it definitely, wa- it, yeah, it definitely waters down the product, right? Exactly. And another thing was they tried to uh, make the uh, Asian uh, Championship Champions League bigger, uh, bigger uh, event. But the problem is Asia is huge, and there's such a, a big difference in, I guess, you know, the economic situation. So, and people don't travel. <laughs> so even that they have a difficult time with that so yeah it's like uh they can try to do it but i think it really comes down to that um you know the east asian teams you know that's always going to compete make the most most uh, money for the federation so yeah yeah i mean it's gonna be difficult always yeah. always comes down to to money in the end uh, the, the proposal by the way is to to grow the uh asian cup from 16 to 24 teams which you know, the World Cup's gone through this a couple of times. We'll continue to have that debate. A lot of people tell you 32 is too many in the World Cup. So it, it's an ongoing right. thing. Hey, Tay, thanks for the call, man. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I no problem. Thank All you. Right, bye. Bye. Uh, good stuff there. You don't get to talk to somebody who knows uh, Asian soccer that well very often. We need, we need to do more of that on this show. All right, let's, uh, let's move along. 518, you're on the air. Hey, Jason. How are you? I'm good. Who's this? My name is Francisco. I'm a kid from New York. I love your show, by the way. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate that, man. Go ahead. What's up? Hey, I was wondering about talking about Mexico. You think it'll be easy for players like Carlos Vela and Giovanni Dos Santos to get back into this team and start with the players like Polito and Oriva Pelota now in the squad? You know, I, this is something we've been tracking here on this show for, you know, since Mexico's struggles really began. Every time we talk to Tom Marshall or Eric Gomez, I, I'm fascinated by what whoever's managing Mexico, and right now Herrera's got the job and he'll be there for a while, but. I'm fascinated by how they're going to balance that out. The domestic players who, look, he took that, that very heavy America uh, team to, to New Zealand, got the job done. When you get ready for the World Cup and you got these big-name European-based players like Vela 
and Chicharito and Dos Santos, and you want to work them back. I just don't know how that works. You're, you've dealt with a, a team that has been so dysfunctional internally over the course of the last 12, 16 months. And to throw those guys back in the mix when you know they're going to feel like they deserve you know, to be handed a starting spot, I don't know. I, I don't know how that works. Oh, and you're right about Rafa Marquez. I believe they should. They should just. He's he's got good veteran experience, but you should go better, more more speed defensive, and go with Massa Rodriguez and Diego Reyes yeah. in your back line instead of instead of Rafa Marquez. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously Rafa's experience and his pedigree is obvious. I mean, that, that, that I mean, it's it's there. It's right in front of you. It, it makes you want to lean on him. And I I know he's played well at Leon. And I know that, that Herrera probably thinks that at the very le- least they need that leadership. Um, but it may come back to bite him. I don't know. I mean, I think you, you take a calculated risk there. I can see why he wants to keep Rafa in that team, though, especially with as much turmoil as they've had. He can be the rock, even though he's kind of made his return recently. Yes, and Jason, one more question. Is there any truth to the United States men's national team coming to play a friendly against Mexico? The the rumors are that it's going to happen in Phoenix in April. Uh, I think they've they've admitted that there's talks, but I don't think that's done yet. You can pretty much guarantee the U.S. and Mexico are trying to line something up ahead of the World Cup. That just t- makes too much sense monetarily for everyone involved. So there's that. All right, Francisco, okay. appreciate the call, man. Thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, g- very good stuff there. All right, let's uh, let's talk about Jerome Champagne. I'm going to go with that because I don't know. It's I took a little bit of French, and I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, this is the guy you may have heard about this. This is the guy who has announced that he's likely to run for FIFA president in 2015. Now, the issue here and sort of the background is that he's been involved in, in FIFA for quite some time. He's a Frenchman. He's also sort of in the he's inside Sepp Blatter's circle. So the story is that he's not going to run if Sepp Blatter decides to stand again. And Sepp Blatter will always say, this is, this is my last run, and then change his mind because that's what Sepp Blatter does. He cannot help himself. So we know Sepp is going to be back. So I don't know if you know why we bother talking about this, but Champagne did bring to the table a platform of proposals that are getting some people talking. Now, let's, let's go down this list. It, it, it's relatively interesting. Number one, and I'm actually borrowing from MLSsoccer.com here uh, where it's, it's outlined in, in numerical form. Orange cards that send players to a sin bin or penalty box like pro hockey. Now, this is, a, this is something that's come up over the last couple of years. It's sort of been muted a couple of times. I don't know that IFAB will ever approve this, but it's interesting. I actually don't think it's a good idea. I think it actually makes the game more complicated. I Look, you, you need to get the referees to be as consistent as possible with your yellow and red system and leave it at that. Number two. Allowing only the, the captain to, to address the referee as in rugby. Fine with that. No more. Look, MLS put in that, uh, that confrontation rule. What do they call it? I don't know. Where, where everybody bum rushes the referee and you can get fined for it. Let's limit the amount of interaction seven guys at a time have with the referee uh, and, and, and overwhelming those guys. Their job is, is hard enough as it is. Number three, allowing referees to move free kicks 10 yards in case of dissent. I don't know what the heck that one's about, but all right. Number four, abolishing the triple punishment that relates in a, a results in a penalty kick, red card, and automatic one-game suspension for a player who denies a clear goal-scoring opportunity. I, I think I am on board with that. I want to see, look, if it's the penalty kick and the player doesn't get sent off, that's fine. Maybe what you can do is tweak the rule. Look, if it's, a, if it's violent conduct and it's a, a, a penalty, okay, fine. Then you're sent off and it's a penalty and you're suspended triple punishment. But if it's merely a foul in the box that creates a that creates a a, a penalty uh, situation, perhaps the red card's not not necessary um, on the the denial of a goal scoring opportunity. Number five, greater use of instant replay video. How and in how you implement that is the detail that I need to know. There, number six, releasing the salary information for FIFA officials. Sure, yeah, do that, please. Number seven, live televised debates for FIFA presidential candidates. That would be fascinating viewing. I'm not sure we'd get anything out of it. But it would be fascinating viewing. Um, look, I, I don't know that this guy's ultimately going to stand. I think his name is amazing. I think his proposals are, some of them are interesting, some of them are a little bit questionable. But as, as long as somebody is out there pushing the conversation forward, I guess that's progress in some fun. But really, if, if you had to lay down a bet right now 
on who the FIFA president is going to be after the next election, who do you put your money on? Or if I presented it this way, you could take the field or Seb Blatter. Who do you put your money on? I'm putting my money on Seb Blatter because I refuse to believe the man is going to voluntarily step aside as long as he believes himself competent. The rest of the world may not believe him competent, but he clearly does. And I don't know that he's, uh, he's drunk on the power and he simply can't let go of the power if he's, uh, if he's uh, locked in there or if it's just a matter of, look, the guy obviously likes being the face of FIFA. He obviously enjoys his job. And that's part of the reason he comes off so negatively to people around the world. It's, it's not just the comical antics. It's not just the foot in the mouth disease that he's got. It's not just the rampant corruption that seems obvious in FIFA. He doesn't project well. If this, if this was a guy who stood up in front of the world and seemed more competent, whether there's corruption going on behind the scenes or not, I don't know that there would be quite as much attention. That doesn't that, that doesn't say that we that not, not to mean that we would excuse corruption or we would excuse FIFA's malfeasance if it was somebody more put together than Seb Blatter. But I think it compounds it does compound the issue when a guy like that's making noises like that in front of rooms full of people and is up on YouTube is leading FIFA. All right. Excellent calls. Thanks for those guys. Let's uh, take a break. When we come back. We will talk to Curtis Larson of the Toronto Sun about this TFC stadium situation. What's next for TFC on the stadium front? And how are the Argos going to impact it? Don't go anywhere. Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV.
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN with Jason Davis. Ignore my music malfunction. That's my fault. Uh, on the line with me now from the Toronto Sun, uh, Curtis Larson writes about TFC up there. And we're here to talk stadiums. Uh, Curtis, how are you, man? Great, man. Never a dull moment in Toronto, is there? No, it doesn't seem to be. You go directly from this uh, massive spending spree on a couple of players. Adding, look, filling out the roster, it looks like things are coming together. Toronto is going to be at least a contender for the playoffs in 2014. And now on top of all of that, we get to talk about uh, Toronto FC stadium situation, specifically because uh, the MLSE or, or the, uh, the owner of MLSE may be in the market for the Toronto Argonauts, the CFL team. And if there's a ground share, what does that mean? And where, do the, where does the soccer team stand on all of this? First of all, um, nuts and bolts of the, of the issue. What are the chances that, that TFC ends up sharing BMO Field with the Argonauts? Well, there's so many moving pieces in this right now. I think you know. It, I, I think in the end, it's um, it's probably you know leaning towards happening. Um, but but right now, it's just a matter of Tim Lewicki's vision to you know put this team that he's built this off season, this team where um, you know bringing in Bradley and Defoe into a stadium that is befitting of the money he's gone out and spent on players. I mean, if you think about it, Emo Field costs something like seventy million dollars to build, and right. well, Bradley and Defoe cost hundred million dollars to bring in. So, mm-hmm. um, the idea is, Lewicki wants to transform this club, you know, um, you know, not only on the pitch but off the pitch as well, with a uh, you know state of the art, possibly sporting Kansas City style venue. Now, is that is that going to happen on that site? Are we talking about a different site? What what is the the future there? You know, in terms of what BMO Field will ultimately be. Well, multiple sites have been mentioned for potential Argo homes, but I think in terms of sharing a stadium, I think you'd see um, whatever they do, a, re, uh, a reconfiguration or uh, expansion or, you know, like I said in, in my piece this week, just, you know, downright tearing it down and starting over. I think you'll see that by the lake where BMO Field is right now. Okay. Now, now, this is interesting to me because effectively what we're dealing with here is TFC having, you know, in, a, in one on one hand, look, 2007 entering the league, being one of the first teams to put on sort of a European style show in the stands. All of that stuff is a credit to Toronto and, and the league needed them at that moment. But they are a victim of timing because they come ahead. They, they get their own building built and they, 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 they enter the league playing at BMO and not having to go through a temporary venue situation. But now they're behind the times when it comes to MLS stadiums because sporting's got sporting park. BBVA Compass Stadium is open. They are now dealing with what Columbus is dealing with. Yeah, it's, you know, it's actually very similar to what Columbus is dealing with. It's, uh, you know, BMO is a very similar stadium, one of those kind of MLS 2.0 stadiums where, you know, in 2007, 2008, the league was just trying to, um, you know, get going and, and trying to build stadiums wherever they could. And I think um, BMO Field is a, is a perfect example of that. And, and, you know, if they don't do it now, if they don't, you know, reconfigure the stadium or build a new one right now, it's going to happen within a decade anyway. <laughs> So I think right now they're looking hard at it. They're looking hard at you know bringing the Argos to BMO Field as well and helping with that expansion, maybe expanding it to thirty thousand. Now, look, I mean, if, if TFC can support uh, uh, thirty thousand in the stands, that's obviously a credit to the team and to to the product, and and, a, and obviously a good thing for MLS. But then we get into the discussion of you know sharing sharing that field with a a football team, uh, the potential wear and tear on the surface, and and obviously. We, we'd end up having a football line debate, Curtis. I, I suggested this yesterday, and I, I put this to people. Would you, would you take 30,000 people and, and you know, roofs on, uh, you know, the roof on, on the stands there at BMO Field um, if it meant football lines? Where do you think the fans of TFC fall on that? Well, I think the fans are split right now, but you also have to remember – that you know, Tim Lewicki has said that soccer is his first you know priority, and there will not be football lines on the field. You know, okay. whether or not you believe that or not, you know, that's <laughs> up to you. But like, all I can do is go off what Tim Lewicki said, and that's sure. that you know, soccer is his first uh, you know priority. There won't be football lines on the field. The grass will be maintained. You know, in the end, it's only going to be the Argos playing roughly ten games a season there. So if they can schedule it out properly, um, you know, I think it can be done. It, but it, it, the the seasons do overlap, doesn't that make it? I mean, even more than than you know, any American football team overlaps with an, an American MLS team. They they play through the summer. They play through the summer. Yeah, it's you know, and, and like I said, this is the contentious point for fans is that uh, you know they want the new venue, but at the same time they want something to call their own. Now, will they be yeah. able to call it their own if the Argos, um, you know, emblem is sitting there? Uh, you know, week in, week out. Um, right. You know, it, it's getting to the point where some fans are so extreme on this issue. Where I read today that some of them are kind of saying, you know, we'd rather not have the vote, not have Bradley, uh, <laughs> and not have a new stadium if it meant the, you know, the Argos playing there. So, 
you know, there are some extreme viewpoints. I think right now we're looking kind of on his media relations PR tour, trying to explain to fans to get fans on side. And I think he's doing a pretty good job of it right now. You know, that's interesting to me. And, and it's a, it's an odd development. I mean, it's obviously an element of the soccer exceptionalism that happens. And, and uh, one of the things that, that we see when we sort of look at the fabric of this game in, in this country and in your country in Canada is soccer fans not being fans of other sports. Do you think that there's a large percentage of the TFC fan base that, that don't give a crap about the Argos or really don't care about the Leafs and, and, and are so soccer specific that, that they are only kind of uh, my, myopic about soccer's future there? I think, you know, I think they're just concerned for the product and the product that they pay for week in, week out. I mean, you've okay. seen, you know, games down at BBA Compass Stadium late in the year with the grasses, you know, you know, quite frankly, disgraceful in a band of playoff game, even. And I think that kind of has, you know, st- you know, struck fear into into the fans of here that thought this club finally got it right. And then, oh, wait, here's another case in the road coming along. Uh, and they're a bit distrustful. And I think the new front office has done a great job um, slowly bringing back that trust and bringing the players and they said they'd get. And, you know, I think some people are actually starting to believe that, you know, Tim Willicke, why don't we, why can't, why shouldn't we believe this guy? He's done everything else that he can do. <laughs> right. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, he he backed himself up uh, with some questions whether or not he would follow through on all of this, and and here we stand talking about TFC now. Sort of a wider picture, Kurt, and 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 you you know you're you're an observer of the league as a whole. Clearly, in, in addition to being on top of what's happening in Toronto, there's going to be some questions as we develop here. And I'm not sure anybody thought TFC would be the first to hit this wall, but there's going to be questions about teams gr- outgrowing their MLS 2.0 stadiums or 1.0 in the case of the Columbus Crew. Uh, that's, you know, I guess the question is, maybe I can get your opinion on this. Should teams, and, and we've got expansion teams coming in, should teams be looking to uh, make sure that they can stay in the same venue and it's ex- expandable? Or I mean, It's a very interesting thing to have to consider because we didn't know these teams were going to be successful in the first place. I mean, I, I think the league's done a good job over the past few years of just following the model of what's worked, what's worked in Kansas City. Right. Building a state-of-the-art venue that happens to be well outside the city, but there's, it's such a, you know, a, a brilliant, you know, theater to watch a game in that fans want to come to it and fans enjoy going to games there. You know, I don't think you can say that about Columbus Crusade. And I don't think fans, you know, take pride in that venue, take pride in going there. I mean, maybe U.S. national team fans because of all the success they've had there. But, you know, Columbus Crew fans, no, I don't think, um, you know, that's something that they're uh, interested in going to week in, week out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you build stadiums like that, I think they'll come. If you do it the right way, I think they'll come. It, it is, uh, it's, it's fascinating. If, uh, if Toronto FC, what's, you know, what's the, um, what's the upper limit here? I mean, if, if they decide, if, if, if ML, MLSE decides to refurbish BMO field and, and, and make it a, a, a dual team facility and it ends up being shared with the, with the Argos and they can get 30,000 in that building, will it have been worth it for your, from your perspective? Or do they need to say, look, if soccer's our focus, if Tim Laiwiki is being truthful about fo- soccer being his focus, then, then TFC deserves their own dedicated venue. Oh, it'd absolutely be worth it, and I think it's absolutely possible. I mean, if you go back to 2000 and 2008, 2007 and 2008, um, you know, the TFC tickets were going for three and four times the value. People were, you know, left outside having to look on from the streets. Um, you know, there are other problems with Emo Field. So it's right by the lake. It's windy as hell, you mm-hmm. know, come fall. And, and there's just so many things that, that, that are wrong with that stadium at the moment that need to go right. You know, the concourse is, is, is terrible. You know, there's not enough um, vendors. The, the, there's not enough restrooms to go around. It's just, it's, it's a big, you know, more or less a big pile of, you know, crap right now. <laughs> and, and sorry, but, you know, um, and I think Lewicki notices that and says, you know, well, it's a bit embarrassing to have a guy like Jermaine Defoe playing in this kind of venue. It, it's interesting, too, because I know that TFC's training facility is, is flat out amazing. And, and there's a disconnect there with, uh, with their actual stadium. Well, and another thing that's kind of scaring TFC fans right now is that, you know, a piece by TSN this week actually mentioned that if MLSC, who owns TFC, buys the, uh, the CFL's Argonauts, they might actually have to move into that Kia training ground and share that facility, uh, which brings up entirely, uh, you know, you know, other uh, issues to look at. That is interesting. So wait, what's the what's the press box situation at, uh, at BMO Field? Uh, Kurt, is it not good either? <laughs> is he have some <laughs> selfish in- <laughs> issues here? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but you know, you know, you hate to complain about it because you know this I was know. a serviceable yeah. venue at the time it was built. Um, you know, TFC did wonders for the league. This city did wonders for the league. Um, you know, uh, as in terms of the press box, it's a bit small, it's a bit cozy. But like, like I said, I don't want to rip on it too much because 
it did serve its need. I think that this league and this team has just grown so much that it's time to have that conversation. And I think it's, uh, I think it's something that you're going to see in the end. Do you, well, I mean, that, that that would be fascinating to see it um, from your perspective, and and I imagine that they're thinking same, this along the same lines in places like Columbus, obviously DC, where they don't even have a decent venue. Is is building or getting a an updated venue or fixing BMO Field, if that's possible, is that intrinsically important to TFC being a success, successful team over the long run? Uh, I think what's intrinsically important this season is actually getting wins. I think that's the first priority right now. Um, the stadium stuff is all kind of a, you know, a sideshow right now that, that fans are interested in talking about because it's the off season. I think if we're in season right now, you'd see a little bit less you know, on this um, until there's further developments from MLSE. Mm-hmm. Don't forget, this is pretty much being driven really heavily by the CFL and by the Argos. Well, Licky right. has commented on it a bit. But uh, in terms of the conversation, it's mostly coming from the Argos side, who are desperate to be sold and desperate to find a venue because, quite frankly, that's the fledgling franchise that uh, is in jeopardy of you know going under if it's not. So, yeah. um, you know, like I said, in, in, intrinsically, I think this uh, this team needs to get W's on the field first. Um, that's the most important thing. I think the next stage after that is moving into a venue that's the stadium of the uh, money they've gone out and spent. Now, to the question of, of winning games, while I have you here. How is uh, what's the, the sort of the scuttle and the chatter around the team with uh, with Michael Bradley um, integrating himself? Obviously, he decided, or or U.S. Soccer decided that he wasn't going to join the the U.S. Men's National Team camp uh, this January. That's clearly a nod to getting him settled in Toronto. How is that? And we know Jermaine Defoe has gone back to um, uh, to Tottenham and will be there till the end of the season. I'm not sure where he is right at this moment. But my understanding is he go back to Tottenham. How is Bradley uh, fitting in, and, and how is sort of the new the new look TFC coming together in the very early you know, stages? You know, I talked to Michael uh, uh, two days ago actually, and he said that he's never been, you know, treated this way at a club anywhere in the world. He's he, he's you know the league is accepted him. TFC has brought him you know brought him in with open arms, and they're treating him extremely well. But at the same time, I think. Right now, in terms of integration, I think they're kind of giving him, you know, weeks off, um, a little bit of light training, a little bit of light fitness, because he is coming off of the season and he is coming off of, um, you know, already being in game shape. So I think they're kind of easing him in, um, which is what they should be. There's a long, uh, a long season coming up. Um, I think it was the right move not to bring him into U.S. national team camp. It's uh, yeah, it, sh- it should it should ultimately benefit his the start to his season with Toronto FC. Um, when does camp open for them? Has it already started? Camp, they actually opened uh, this week. They're in uh, Bradenton, Florida, the IMG Academy, um, just going through some fitness and uh, uh, really just uh, easing in stuff. They'll have a preseason game uh, next week, and uh, that's when things really start to get rolling, I think. Uh, one of the more fascinating stories heading into the MLS season, certainly Toronto FC with all of the money that they've spent, and now we've got the, the as you mentioned, the stadium sideshow to talk about. That's uh, Curtis Larson, writer for the Toronto Sun, covering uh, Toronto FC. Thank you for your time, Curtis. Appreciate it, man. Anytime. All right, talk to you soon. Uh, there goes Kurt. Let's uh, let's move along here. A couple of news and notes as we get ready to close down the show. The last 15 minutes of this particular episode. Phone lines open, as always, 347-756-6276. Let me start with Jermaine Jones, U.S. international midfielder. We, we took the phone call about him moving to Turkey. <clears throat> I will just say again and sort of reiterate it here for anybody who missed it while we were covering other topics. I definitely think this is a solid move for him to a competitive league competitive environment obviously turkey is known for their incredible support these uh, the, certainly the biggest clubs there uh, so at Besiktas uh, or Besiktas um, Jermaine Jones should uh, should be able to find his legs and that should help him for for the world cup i mean it's for me it's not necessarily the level although again turkey is a good level it's it's about playing and consistently playing and that clearly there were some issues as to whether that, that was going to happen at Schalke for Jermaine Jones all right uh, moving along marco papa has returned to MLS, uh, that news is out. Stephen Goff, in fact, tweeted that out yesterday. Michael Marco Papa has signed a deal with Major League Soccer and will go through the allocation process. Now, I think, man, I should have had the allocation order in front of me before I decided to talk about Marco Papa. Do you know who's at the top of the allocation order right now? Mr. Hayward. Can I ask my, my producer for, a, for an assist? All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. Damn, I should know this off the top of my head. I apologize. I know Seattle has been talking um, about Marco Papa, but now I'm seeing rumors that Eric Freiburg might be on his way back to to Seattle. Although I guess Bologna has some interest. It is silly season, and that's not just in Europe. Although transfer deadline day coming tomorrow, nine two eight, you're on the air. Do you know the allocation order? 
Uh, absolutely no idea, nor do I care. <laughs> What's up? Uh, Jay, apologies. You know, I haven't been listening to the show, so I don't know if you've been discussing this. <clears throat> but I'm just wondering, has there been any discussion about the dimensions of a Canadian football league field uh, in, in relation to BMO Field? Because, you know, a Canadian football league field is 150 yards yes. because of the 20-yard end zones and the 55-yard line. Yes. I mean, I, I've never been to BMO, but I... I, I they couldn't even fit in. They couldn't fit in either end zone at this point. So they they have to be significant renovation of that place for them to put a Canadian Football League team in. It just didn't seem to make any sense to me. Why wouldn't they play over at the Sky Dome or whatever they're calling it now? The, you mean the 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 CFL team? Yeah, that's where they play now. So I mean, I don't. What are they getting? By moving over to BMO Field, I mean, what are they gaining? Uh, you know, I'm not com- I'm completely sure about that. Although the Rogers Center, which is formerly the Sky Dome, was a baseball stadium. It's not. It's not actually configured, as far as I'm aware, for football. So it's 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 really not the best setup for them. I imagine it's, they're probably losing money on that venue. It's probably too big. There are a lot of things that that could be happening with the Argos. Y- your point about the size of the stadium has been addressed. I didn't talk to Curtis uh, Curtis Larson about it, but he does include it in his piece at the Toronto Sun discussing uh, TFC's stadium future because, as you said, it's a bigger field. It would actually push the supporters away from the field, and I'm, that's clearly not something that they want to see happen. Well, I, I think they're okay with the width because, you know, a Canadian football field is, is much wider than an NFL field, but I, I, it's about the same width, I believe, as a standard soccer field. So I just think it's the, the length that's yes. the problem. But yeah. anyway, you know, I think they've taken great steps forward, you know, with Bradley and Defoe and all that, but I think this would be a tremendous step backwards if they're sharing a field with a, a football team Canadian football team and then have to start throwing an artificial turf back on the surface. Well, ag- 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 again, I think that it is dependent on what they get, what TFC gets out of the deal, man. I think, I think that there is, look, nobody wants to see the, the seats behind the goal pushed back 10 yards and, and so far away from the field that you can't really see them impacting the game. We want supporters to be influencing the game. That's the whole point of showing up and singing for an entire 90 minutes. But if there are, if, if all of those stands, get roofed and if they increase capacity to 30,000 and suddenly TFC has 30,000 people in the building week to week and it's enclosed on some level and keeping that noise and I think the ends would be open or or the corners would be open in the English style which is what LiWiki has uh, alluded to that's still a major improvement um, for TFC over what they're they're what they have now which is as Curtis Larson painted it sort of it's the erector set type stadium. It's Columbus with a little bit more sheen on it. Well, and a lot of a lot of the American stadiums, you know, the, the soccer specific ones are that way. I mean, they're very cookie cutter because they're cheap because that's all we can afford. But I, I'm just, yeah, you know, I'm just wondering though. I mean, Jason, I don't know if you've heard this or not, and I haven't. Has there been any sort of significant increase in the season ticket sales? For TFC with, yeah. the, with these signings? Yeah, they, they basically sold out their season ticket allotment um, the minute they announced these signings. Yeah. That's oh, a, really? that happened. I, mean, I, know their, I know their attendance had gone down the last few years. Sure, sure. So they're understandably. that it's going to recover? I believe so, yes. In fact, again, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I do recall seeing some numbers that TFC effectively sold out their season tickets in the immediate aftermath of these big moves. So clearly there's, look, it was just about showing that commitment on the part of MLSE. They went out, they do- dropped a bunch of money on these, on these big name players. They've made some improvements on the, in the rest of the squad, which may go, you know, may fly under the ra- radar, but are equally as important to their MLS fortunes. And I think that for the most part, they've kind of recaptured the soccer imaginations of, of that community. By the way, just to throw this in, a couple of people telling me that the Argos are actually being kicked out of the Rogers Center because... Uh, the Blue Jays want to move to grass, which would obviously, uh, you know, wear, wear and tear on a baseball field with football yeah. does not equate to, to baseball. Now, again, the, you know, I, I'll say that there was that there's still issues with soccer. You don't want to torn up field uh, for soccer either. Um, so th- there would have to be some some promises on the part of MLSC if this deal went through that the soccer team would not be negatively impacted. Man, I appreciate the call. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit more about MLS and, and specifically about expansion. Um, last night in San Antonio, I mentioned Mexico playing South Korea. 
sort of alongside that happening, there was a meeting between um, Julian Castro, the mayor of San Antonio, Gordon Hartman, the owner of the San Antonio Scorpions, and MLS Commissioner Don Garber. Now, apparently this was a, an informal meeting. It wasn't, in, it wasn't formal talks over MLS coming to San Antonio, but the commissioner went to the, to the city um, for this soccer event to discuss with, discuss with these two guys, uh, the mayor and the owner, uh, the potential of MLS soccer in, uh, in San Antonio. And uh, from what I'm reading here, Garber said it was a great me- meeting. San Antonio is a tremendous city. The Scorpions are very impressive. Hartman, it was, a good, uh, it was a lot of good back and forth in respect to where MLS stands. I think the commissioner has seen we have a proven model here. He's seen the infrastructure. He met a mayor who's a true leader and recognizes the potential and wants to see something happen. All of those things put us on a level of consideration, but I can't tell you what level, uh, what that level is. And then there's the question. There's the the hundred million dollar question. Whatever the f- expansion free, uh, fee ends up being, come number twenty four, because based on the landscape of things, it's pretty clear Miami's getting in. Miami's coming. David Beckham's going to get his team. There, there really is no argument that uh, that says MLS isn't going to do that. It seems like. A foregone conclusion. Atlanta, from everything that I know, MLS is lining up Atlanta. Uh, Arthur Blank is lining up MLS to play in his, in his new Falcon Stadium. They may end up with a situation that, that requires the, the stadium configuration to be changed for soccer versus football, but we've seen that done in MLS before. MLS showed no hesitation giving the Vancouver Whitecaps an MLS franchise uh, when they when their plan was to move into BC Place, when their own stadium deal fell through, so if that's the standard, and this is a stadium deal that MLS can uh, can get behind, then you're going to see Atlanta get in as number 23. So who's 24? I'm not sure. And I mentioned the other day that I thought San Antonio was a leading candidate. I still think that the commissioner going to San Antonio is an indication of that. I think Charlotte could be a player, and I failed. I, I mentioned St. Louis. My thing about St. Louis, and I've, a couple of people have tweeted me and, and sent me some things. Uh, I saw an open letter to David Beckham about St. Louis uh, from an expat who was making the case for his adopted hometown. Look, I understand that there is a passion, and the St. Lu- uh, Louis St. Louis is the group behind the push for an MLS team in, in St. Louis. I understand that there is passion in St. Louis. There is no doubt that soccer is... One of the uh, it, soccer plays a major role in the culture of St. Louis and has for a very long time. And I would love to see an MLS team in St. Louis. I've yet to see anybody of consequence step up and say, we've got the money, we've got the stadium plan, let's go. And that's the issue in St. Louis. Uh, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm going to put them at the back of the pack, despite the fact I think that that's a, a strong MLS, potentially a uh, potential MLS market. The other, the other city I failed to mention, and, and I really have no excuse for this, because there actually is some sort of talk about a, an MLS stadium or about making something happen there, is Minnesota. The Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'm assuming that the stadium would be in Minneapolis, but I don't really know the geography that well. That is a dark horse that I really don't, I, I really can't handicap. I'm really not sure how strong a potential MLS market Minneapolis is. I know that they've got the NASL team, Minnesota United. They've gone through a couple of changes in ownership. I know that they've got a big money owner in, um, in the former head of, of United Health Group. There are a lot of factors that are clicking into place for Minneapolis that, that put them ahead of maybe everybody except San Antonio. We've got plenty of places where where ownership groups of minor league teams are talking about big aspirations and moving up. Sacramento's done it. Pretty sure somebody in Oklahoma City has done it. I'm not positive either one of those places m- merits the next, the 24th spot. Maybe down the road, if MLS says, all right, we're, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to, uh, we're, we're going to go to 30, we'll have, uh, or, four, or 28, and we'll have uh, 14 team conferences, and you play within your conference. And if they do that, then there is a, a litany of, of markets that have a, a possible uh, shot at MLS. But this, this number 24 spot, if Miami is a done deal, assume it is, if Atlanta is a done deal, it's getting closer, is going to be the fascinating talking point when it comes to, 
to expansion. And then, and then we'll be done for maybe sometime, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe 24 is not the end for the foreseeable future. But when Garber said we're going to get to 24 by 2020, I'm not sure anybody had the idea that they would get to 23, perhaps named 23 by 2014 or 2015, have that fourth, that 24 team identified and playing in the league by when? 2017, 2018, possibly? Maybe? I mean, that's four years away. 2018 is four years away. It doesn't seem like that long, but it's enough time for a lot of things to move very, very quickly. And the, and the commissioner has, again, reiterated that they need a stadium deal in place in Miami, for example. Now, I think that, you know, he's doing his due diligence in, in expressing that David Beckham is not going to get any breaks here. And I do think that a stadium built for the team is crucial to Miami's success, whatever form they take. But then we have to ask the question, well, what about New York City FC? New York City is exceptional. $100 million is exceptional. They're willing to put up with that team playing in Yankee Stadium. Where else are they going to play? It's still not confirmed. Every, every outlet in New York, when talking about a potential stadium site for a soccer uh, building in New York, says the team is going to play in Yankee Stadium to start their, uh, start their lives. But the league has yet to confirm that. New York City FC has yet to confirm that. So where do they sit? What's the situation? Is de Blasio going to torpedo everything? Trevor, tell me quickly. Is de Blasio going to torpedo New York City FC stadium plans? I don't know. I don't know. It'll get done, says Trevor. There you go. You heard it here first. Trevor Hayward guaranteeing that NYCFC gets the stadium done in the city of New York thanks to the New York Yankee influence. All right. Wrapping up a Thursday show, I'm going to give my performance like a four. That wasn't that great. But we did have good guests. Steve Goff, Washington Post, Chris Larson, the Toronto Sun. Uh, good stuff there from both of those guys on MLS Topics. Um, we will come back tomorrow. Tomorrow is transfer deadline day. NBC is doing is blowing the doors out on a transfer deadline day, which means I have a decision to make. Am I going to pull up Sky and, and watch Jim White, or am I going to trade that for the American version here? It's a tough call. I get wrapped up in, I'm not, look, I don't like the rumor thing until it's done, but I do like the buzz of transfer deadline day. No, I, I'm saying like, should I, bu- sh- sh- yeah. the only consideration says Trevor is whether or not Jim White's involved. Jim White's involved. That's the one I'm watching. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> Jim White's in the bill. One day, one, my, that's, that's my new dream. I just, I just came up with a new dream. One day I want to be on some level where people acknowledge I'm in the building. When I walk into the building, that's what they do with Jim White on transfer deadline day. Jim White is in the building. I want that kind of, I want that kind of respect. <laughs> how do I get that? How do, I, how do I get that? All right, we'll, we'll be here. We'll certainly go over some of the rumors as we approach uh, the deadline. We won't be on the air during the deadline, clearly. But we will be, uh, we'll certainly talk about some of the things as, as that builds up. And I'll be fascinated to see, purely from an American standpoint, whether we get anybody leaving in this window. It doesn't seem like it's likely to happen. But then again, I'm not sure anybody saw Breck Shea going to Stoke in, last year. Was there any chatter about that before the last day? It'd be interesting to see. Uh, in the meantime, please go to iTunes, ratings and reviews. Help us out a lot on this show. Get us up there. Push us higher. I'd love to be the top-rated soccer show. I'm not sure that's going to happen. Uh, Football Weekly is a juggernaut. Football Rambles out there. Uh, those guys up in New York with the Blazers are a thing. So maybe we won't be the top-rated po- soccer podcast. But uh, <laughs> but it'd be nice to get a chance to do that. So ratings and reviews at, uh, at iTunes help us out a lot. Um, Stitcher and tune in and uh, iHeartRadio if you need a place to listen to the show live or on delay uh, where podcasts are available at nasn.tv send Trevor email Trevor at nasn.tv because I find that funny and uh, and we'll talk to you guys what's tomorrow Friday 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 Trevor at nasn.tv just say hi just send him an email and say hi <laughs> talk to you later bye <laughs>